Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The world certainly has its ways. Take this for example. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Christians, too, have their ways. Presumably none of us would ever do anything like that to another human being. Presumably all of us would act the way the Samaritan did, or you would at least have the best of intentions to do so. Why? Because of God's grace, of course. The same grace which, together with truth, came through Jesus Christ. The grace of God, which would not let sin overtake it, but abounded all the more. The very grace which was upon the first followers of the way as they gathered in Jerusalem. The same grace which even to us is the source of blessing, one blessing after another. Yes, the grace lavished even upon us, believers of this late hour, thanks to which we too have redemption through Jesus' blood and the forgiveness of sins. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. There is no doubt that grace renews and empowers it transforms those alienated and hostile in mind, those given to evil deeds into men and women who may now be presented blameless and holy and above reproach. Grace enables ways of its own, and even more so, it makes the impossible possible. But here, here the simple answers end. How does grace do all this? Even more fundamentally, what is grace? Can I touch it? Can I see it? Can I feel it? Can I know it? Can I know that it is mine deep at the bottom of my heart? The spirits divide precisely over the reality of grace. Where does grace find its reality? The standard view on the eve of the Reformation, a view reaffirmed by the Council of Trent, was that grace is God's gift given gratis. This gift, as St. Thomas maintains, affects the essence of the soul. It brings about a certain regeneration and recreation. So much so that the soul can now be said to participate in divine goodness. By God's grace, the soul becomes a vehicle of God's own goodness. It becomes graceful and gracious. This said, we may still ask, what exactly is this transformative gift of grace? What does it look like? The answer that Thomas gives is that grace is a habitual gift infused into the soul, or more simply, a new disposition in the mind, a habit beyond the habits that humans can naturally develop. Thomas enumerates five ways in which grace affects us. Five ways in which the operation of this new habit shows itself. Of these, the first is to heal the soul. The second, to desire good. The third, to carry into effect the good proposed. The fourth, to persevere in the good and the fifth, to reach glory. To put it more simply, grace foreruns 
and grounds charity. It so transforms human nature that human nature becomes capable of the virtue of love and indeed becomes truly loving. Without grace, there is no real charity. Grace on Thomas's account seems like a truly wonderful thing. But there is, there is a caveat. Since grace is not an efficient cause, but a supernatural quality that is infused into and suffuses the soul, it cannot be isolated or grasped as such. Consequently, for Thomas, no person can know in and of himself or herself that he or she has grace. Such knowledge can only be inferred from signs. Anyone, Thomas goes on to explain, may know that he has grace when he is conscious of delighting in God and of despising worldly things. And inasmuch as a man is not conscious of any mortal sin, but rather experiences a certain sweetness. As necessarily indirect, the subjective knowledge of grace is, at best, only imperfect. The picture becomes even more complicated in addition to the indirect way in which grace is known for Thomas, there is also the very real possibility that this sanctifying grace can be lost through mortal sin. Even a believer may willfully choose not to rely on the power of grace to do the right thing. He or she may instead choose to do the opposite and violate God's law in full knowledge of what is being done. In this way, the believer chooses to prefer sin to God's friendship and acts as an obstacle to the outpouring of divine love. The believer effectively falls into another habit and as a result damages and disempowers the received habit of gracious love. That habit can then be reconstituted only through another infusion of grace. After baptism, the ordinary procedure is the sacrament of penance and the absolution given there. What is interesting to note here is that although true charity is certainly impossible without grace, without grace enabling it. The other theological virtues, faith and hope, can actually exist without grace. To be sure, they will now lack vigor. Faith, with no grace-enabled love to give it shape, will remain unformed and lifeless. It will have no externalization or concretion, but even in the absence of saving grace, faith and hope may remain in the person in an inchoate way. The Reformation rejected the view of grace as an infused disposition. The Reformers questioned whether seeing grace as a power of habit captured what grace was fundamentally about. One reason for this skepticism and opposition was subjective, the spiritual toll on the believer. The reformers asked, can you ever actually know, even in an imperfect way, the reality of grace let alone be confident of it. If we take sin into account, even imperfect knowledge becomes questionable. 
Can you ever enjoy grace if it requires tireless exercise through acts of charity in fear that a single mortal sin can undermine the whole? Can you rest in saving grace when it is forfeited so easily? Even more fundamentally, can you ever be confident of the reality of grace if, instead of a paragon of spiritual virtue, you find yourself a repeat offender again and again. But say we allow that one actually could scrupulously avoid all mortal sin. It seems that even then the believer could have no confidence of having grace. For Thomas, as we have noted, you know that you have grace when you are conscious of delighting in God and of despising worldly things, and as much as you're not conscious of any mortal sin. But is this ever the believer's experience? The signs and the operation of grace are hardly grounds for this kind of self-satisfaction, for they are not as unambiguous as Thomas makes them out to be. Can I ever know that my desire to do good hides no ulterior motive, no attachment to worldly things, no secret pride? Are you always able to carry it into effect with a single-minded resolve? If not, then can you ever hope to persevere in the good? Luther's own experience in the Augustinian monastery shows the tall order of experiencing what Thomas calls a certain sweetness of grace. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, Luther writes famously, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. Whether Luther was overly sensitive is beside the point here. The question still remains. Is not the believer a believer precisely because he or she always approaches God as a sinner in desperate need of grace? It is with this insight at the forefront that the Reformation challenged the subjective perspective on the reality of grace. Introspection is not the path to establishing it. Introspection cannot deliver the confidence and knowledge of grace, however imperfect, that it promises. Instead, and worse still, it turns every thought of God as the giver of grace into a thought about the self. Do I have grace? Do I have it yet? Do I still have it? The Reformation's response was that where grace is at stake, we must instead begin with God. And it is on God that we must keep our focus. Negatively speaking, the Reformation offered a view of grace alternative to the introspective pursuit. The introspective path, the reformers argued, had a tremendous spiritual cost. It could lead only to despair, if one was honest with oneself, or it could lead to pride, if one lacked such honesty. Despair or pride. We must note, however, that what the Reformation proposed as an alternative 
was not just a counter-reaction to the dominant view, some novel idea or just some easier idea. The reformers' understanding was the fruit, in a positive way, of their reflection on God's faithfulness. It is when one thinks through God's decisive act of love, mercy, and faithfulness in Christ, when one works out the implications of Golgotha and Easter Day, that one cannot but come to an altogether different view of the reality of grace. The basic reason for the reformers' skepticism and opposition to viewing grace as an infused habit was therefore not subjective, but the basic reason was objective. It was scriptural. Grace, Luther insists in his preface to Romans of 1522, grace actually means God's favor or the goodwill which in himself he bears towards us. This favor must not be collapsed or absorbed into some subjective dimension of the person. It must be allowed to stand over against the person, and it must remain central. Grace is God's own disposition, a disposition that God himself sustains, exercises, and demonstrates, by which he is disposed to give us Christ and to pour into us the Holy Spirit with his gifts. What Luther indicates is that there is a crucial distinction, a crucial distinction between, on the one hand, grace and its peculiar gift, and on the other hand, all the other gifts a person may receive and take into themselves. As God's favor, grace is one, indivisible, perfect and complete. Its living embodiment is Christ himself. He is God's favor extended to us. He is a gift before all gifts, a gift unlike any other. Luther explains, when you see or hear of Christ doing or suffering something, you do not doubt that Christ himself, with his deeds and suffering, belongs to you. On this you may depend as surely as if you had done it yourself, indeed, as if you were Christ himself. What Luther implies by this identification as if you were Christ himself, is that even though Christ is offered to the believer, it is the believer who is actually embraced by Christ. The preaching of Christ summons us to find ourselves in Christ, in his person and in his work. The news of God's favor takes the believer out of the self. The believer ends up being caught up in Christ. The letter to the Colossians captures, captures this unique dynamic. As you receive Jesus Christ, so also walk in him. Believers, therefore, exist outside of themselves, finding themselves in Christ, finding their very selves where God has established his grace. In Christ, in Christ, we are infinitely more than we could ever make of ourselves. And in him, we are everything we could ever hope to be. We should note that on this understanding, grace and faith belong inseparably together. Faith simply takes God at his word, takes him for who he shows himself to be. 
Faith believes God to be gracious and grasps his favor. It grasps Christ himself. Faith trusts that the Son whom the Father holds up before us is where I now belong, who I truly am, and it transports us into Christ. Here, the body of the flesh is put off by the circumcision of Christ. And we know, as those caught up into Christ, that we already are on the other side of death. God's favor thus comes with a peculiar gift, the gift of Christ. Even as the gift is offered to me, it is I who am received by Christ and into Christ. So much so that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In contrast to this fundamental gift, the gifts of the Spirit are plural, partial, and halting. They are indeed poured into believers, and as Luther observes, they increase in us every day, but they are not yet perfect since there remain in us evil desires and sins that war against the Spirit. Believers certainly put the gifts to work and enjoy their fruits. Throughout, however, their eyes remain fixed on the giver, the one who remains ever gracious. In Calvin's words, God touches the sinner with a sense of his goodness in order that he, the sinner, despairing of his own works, may ground the whole of his salvation in God's mercy. The Reformation's perspective on grace was certainly Christ-centered, as it sought to do honor to God and God's work. Now, it belongs to one of the greatest ironies in the history of Protestant Christianity that this very emphasis on the objectivity of grace also brought with itself a tremendous subjective cost. Rather unexpectedly, it generated precisely what it criticized and sought to overcome. It brought with itself introspection, which one could argue turned out to be spiritually as perilous and just as damaging as the medieval view of grace. How so? Briefly put, the assertion of God's favor did not as such provide an answer to the question whether God was actually gracious to me. To say that God has shown favor, that he is gracious, is not the same as finding assurance of his favor toward me, me personally. How can I know? What does God's favor look like? The desperate search for a faith within as a way of assuring oneself of God's grace belongs to the Protestant repertoire of attempted answers. So does a pursuit of a foundational grounding experience, a pursuit no different from Thomas's insistence that a grace person will delight in God, despise worldly things, leave mortal sin behind, and in general experience a certain sweetness. The American career of the doctrine of double predestination also belongs here. But to say that God is not and will not be gracious to all does not resolve the issue. It simply gives it up. And it only makes believers more desperate for personal assurance. It is an unspeakable tragedy, the sort of tragedy where the gospel is silenced, that a theologian as brilliant as Jonathan Edwards can do no better then tell Christians not to try to divine their assurance from within, 
from their bare affections. They ought rather to look to their godly works, their consistency, and their persistence, and therein find evidence of God's favor and their own assurance. Hardly the objectivity of grace that the reformers had in mind. So what do we do? What do we do as Reformation's children in face of its impending anniversary? How do we commemorate it, the event, the historical period, the theology, the mindset? We certainly should not do so in a self-congratulatory manner. The best way to commemorate the Reformation, I suggest, is to learn from its witness, its earnest striving to honor divine grace and to do justice to God's favor. We can only be children and heirs of the Reformation if we undertake their task and do so both faithfully and critically, self-critically above all. So listen. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers. The parable that Jesus tells is hardly a cute story that invites us to be nice, to make a little bit of difference in this hell of a world in which religious leaders no less turn a blind eye to the plight of a nobody and probably with good reasons galore at hand, collateral damage, after all, is a fact of life. To say so is brutal, but at least it is honest. Yet what we have here is no pep talk, exhorting us to make a little bit of difference in a world where people waylay people in thought, word, and deed, and then leave them for dead. No, exhortation is not the point here. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan in response to a series of questions by a lawyer seeking to put him to the test. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer asks. Well, what does the law say? Asks Jesus in turn. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor just as yourself. Then Jesus said to the lawyer, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. What comes next is a nail in the coffin of pep talks. The lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? The lawyer demands practicality. Not that he is lazy. One should certainly exert oneself. One should try hard, very hard. No doubt about that. One should by all means do one's best. No pains, no gains, as they say. But we should also be practical. What good is there in an impossible standard? We should cut the law's demand to our measure, perhaps our heroic measure, so we could also find self-validation in our effort. The lawyer, you see, wants to discern and grasp the signs of grace, of eternal life, of the final reward. He desires to find those in himself. But he is aware, if only implicitly, how ambiguous that inner testimony can be, how recalcitrant our ulterior motives, how mysterious our desires, how uncontrollable our revulsions. Hence, his question, who is my neighbor? Intended in all good faith 
to make things difficult, but at the same time also manageable. But the perversion and the audacity reach even further. Freud has probably articulated best the nature of the self-justification that we see here. A love that does not discriminate seems to me to forfeit a part of its own value by doing an injustice to its object. In other words, love that simply loves is nothing special. Now, a love that is selective is true love, for it does justice to those who truly deserve it. And of course, by withholding itself, it also does justice to those who don't deserve it. And so, we justify our ineptitude, our made-to-measure practicality, and adding insult to injury, we cover this self-justification with a seeming concern for the neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Freud continues, my love is something valuable to me, which I ought not to throw away without reflection. It imposes duties on me, for whose fulfillment I must be ready to make sacrifices. If I love someone, he must deserve it in some way." End of quote. Here, all pep talk runs aground, all exhortation to being nice. A higher law, my sacred duty to love itself and to the neighbor is invoked for the preservation of the law of love itself. I must know, mustn't I, who my neighbor is? How else could I truly love? How else would my love be, well, love? Jesus doesn't ignore the lawyer's question. But Jesus also knows that the lawyer's question has no answer. It is the kind of question that gets asked when things are already desperately wrong and time itself is out of joint. This kind of question can only be asked by someone who has lost sight of God's favor, who is searching for this favor within, who has a need to justify himself or herself. Someone, mind you, who will also think that God's law is being protected and upheld in the process. Jesus doesn't answer the lawyer's question. Instead, he tells a story with a question of its own. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? At this very point, all practicality, all heroism, all concern for the law, all excuses fall away. And one question, one question only begins to crystallize itself. Could I go and do likewise? Rather than ask, who is my neighbor? Could I prove to be a neighbor to others, whoever they chance to be? Could I do the impractical, the impossible? Could I risk my love? Could I trust God? that he will, in fact, preserve his own law and does not need my patronizing judgment? Could I be this reckless, this loving, this free? The incident with the lawyer offers no answer to these questions. We don't know what the lawyer did or didn't do. 
and it doesn't really matter. By the time we get to the parable's end, it addresses us. It addresses us who are thrown into the ways of the world. And here, we repeatedly face the question, who is my neighbor? And we repeatedly pose it to ourselves and others. Who is my neighbor? That's just how the world goes round. That's how far its love goes. As Christians, our very real temptation is to take God's law and bring it down to our measure, a somewhat heroic measure, of course, with the hope that we could make the world a bit nicer and more God-pleasing. And then our temptation is to congratulate ourselves on the great gracefulness with which we have done it all. The commandments? Oh, I've kept those since my youth. But do we really want this grace from within? The sweetness of lies that we have told to ourselves. Perhaps, just perhaps, when we let God's law stand without qualification, reservation, defense, and savior complex, perhaps we will actually see something, something terrible and something terrific. We will see that as the law stands over against us, no questions asked, a terrifying and impossible yoke, it actually takes the shape of a person. Look, its shape is that of the parable teller, one like the Son of Man, who has loved God his Father with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength and with all his mind, even with drops of blood on his forehead and nails in his hands and vinegar and gall on his lips. He was sent like a lamb to the slaughter at the hands of a world that asks facetiously and perversely, but who is my neighbor? And then answers itself, surely not he, crucify him. But this man loved, loved God his Father, even with his mind numb in God-forsakenness and his strength all but gone, killed by his very own neighbors. Do you see him? When we let God's law stand without qualification, reservation, defense, or savior complex, it has the shape of a man who loved his neighbor as himself. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When we were busy asking, who is my neighbor? Christ was a neighbor to the neighborless, to prostitutes, sinners, tax collectors, and even to his own killers. The law now stands over against us, fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Look. And the good news? The good news is that God the Father has raised his Son from the dead, also for our justification. The risen Christ at the Father's right hand is the living favor of God. He is the one from, who from God's very bosom expresses God's own disposition, God's own disposition to be a neighbor and a friend to us. A call now goes out over and over again to find ourselves in Jesus Christ, who is now to us exactly who he was to the helpless crowds that followed him. 
He is grace upon God's grace. Even to those who only want to have themselves as their neighbor, or only people just like themselves. He is grace upon God's grace even to us in our disgrace that we scarcely know of. St. Thomas was right. Grace brings about a certain regeneration and recreation because the soul now comes to participate in divine goodness. But this participation is not through goodness infused into me as a certain power, the power to overcome myself, to be a better version of myself. It is not some mysterious, precarious, and elusive grace within. Rather, it is goodness that I am caught up into, body and soul. It is the living Christ. He is the reality of God's grace. The living Christ by whom all things were created, through whom God reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, and in whom all things hold together. The living Christ has set aside the ways of the world. They are no longer inevitable or inescapable. He has set aside our self-justification, our very need to justify ourselves. In Christ, philosophy and empty deceit have run their course. The elemental spirits of the world have been overcome and human tradition and custom no longer determine how we must act. The unthinkable has become possible. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. Those alienated and hostile in mind, those of all people have actually found a neighbor. The living Christ makes the impossible possible. Also for us in the here and now. Look, there is a washing one does not have to qualify or compete for. Baptism is not like some ancient mystery cult or a secret initiation beyond the reach of ordinary mortals. Here, putting off the body of flesh those earthly ways by the circumcision of Christ. We have been buried with him and raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Here, finding ourselves in Christ, we can be as Christ is, both to the godly and to the godless, a neighbor. There is also a table where heavenly food never runs out and where all are welcome and there is still room. A banquet for the neighborless and a foretaste of the feast to come. And there is a good word, the word of Christ crucified and now living. You are forgiven, my brother, my friend, my neighbor. Trust me, this word is no other than the freeing word of the new creation. Let there be humans in our image and likeness. As long as the living Christ is at work, here in the midst of the world, grace is a reality for you and for me. The Lord's continued action becomes the place and framework for ours. With God at work for us and for our salvation, establishing us in the faith, building us into Christ's body, we can dream big. It all starts with the church, the mother of all believers, to use Calvin's phrase, where the ways of the world are no longer inevitable, where they are no longer inescapable. Here, the question is not, who is my neighbor? 
The question is rather being the person who has God as his neighbor. Who can I now be a neighbor to? It all begins with the church and the sky's the limit. In closing, let me say only this. You want to know about the reality of grace? Then listen. A man was going down from Anniston to Montgomery, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And when you think you've heard, when you think you've heard, then come, touch, taste, and see that the Lord is good. He is merciful and he is just, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Walk in Christ. Walk in the reality of his grace. It is for you. Be nourished and strengthened by it. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, which exceeds all philosophy and empty deceit, that peace keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.